thanks for the introduction. Um, like you said, I'm going to be presenting today on um, anatomical variations in the extensor indices proprius and some of those clinical implications that come along with it. So before I start, I just want to briefly dive into what the extensor indices is. Uh, the extensor indices proprius muscle is contained within the posterior compartment of the antebrachium. It functions to independently extend the second digit. Classically, the extensor indices arises from the posterior surface of the distal ulna, distal to the origin of the extensor pollicis longus. Its tendon forms proximal to the extensor retinaculum before traversing deep to it and continuing along the ulnar aspect of the extensor digitorum tendon towards its insertion site. Uh, it inserts onto the uh, extensor digitorum tendon opposite the head of the second metacarpal. And while this is the classic morphology that is seen in the extensor indices, um, it has been found to be an area of intense uh, anatomic variation. Uh, initially, these variations were described by Komiyama in 1999. Uh, he established a classification system for variants in which he found that there were four main types and a total of eight subtypes. In 2018, Georgiev expanded this classification to include 24 different subtypes. And then currently, our study has expanded the classification more to include 29 different subtypes. Um, as there are 29 subtypes, I'm not going to talk in depth about each of the subtypes. Um, if anybody is interested, I'm more than happy to discuss with them at a future time. I will discuss um, some of the more prevalent of the subtypes, though. Throughout our research, we found a total of 17 of the 29 subtypes in at least one donor on one side. Of the 17, uh, these were the three most prevalent. Uh, type 0, which was found to be about 60.2% of our samples. Um, this is our classic morphology with the one muscle belly and one tendon inserting onto the ulnar side of the extensor digitorum. And then we had type 2A1 and type 2B1, which were both found to be uh, present in about 6.1% of samples. Type 2A1 exhibits this classic tendon, and then there is also an accessory tendon inserting onto the radial side of the extensor digitorum tendon. And then type 2B1 has the classic tendon, and then there's an accessory tendon inserting onto the same spot as the classic tendon on the ulnar side of that extensor digitorum tendon. And then, uh, so what were we trying to accomplish with this study? So the project aimed to explore the variations of extensor indices and look at their individual prevalence. Uh, we also wanted to see how these um, different classifications affect the morphology of the muscles and tendons themselves. Uh, for our specimens, we were able to use about 50, or not about, we were able to use 50 formalin embalmed cadavers for a total of 98 extensor indices. 48 of these were um, bilateral, and there were two donors that we were only able to use one side on, resulting in unilateral dissections. We had 49 from the right and 49 from the left, respectively. Uh, as for our initial dissection, uh, initially superficial soft tissue was removed from the antebrachium uh, by the OMS-1 students. Uh, the extensor digitorum was identified and reflected from its proximal origin. From there, the muscles of the uh, dorsal antebrachium were separated to help identify the extensor indices. And then after the muscles were separated, we took um, care to trace them from the most proximal origin all the way to the insertion sites, uh, taking special care to preserve all accessory muscle bellies and all accessory tendons. For measurements, um, after the muscle was identified, we initially classified um, each extensor indices based on Georgiev's previously established system. If the morphology did not match Georgiev's previous classification, it was noted and we expanded upon that later. From there, we found the center of the extensor indices muscle. Uh, we identified this using the intersection of the three triangles formed by the proximal origin, distal origin, and the musculotendinous junction. 
Uh, the picture on the right there shows how we line those triangles up to find the muscle center. From there, the muscle center was then measured from the ulnar styloid process, and ulnar length was also measured. We divided the distance from the ulnar styloid by the ulnar length to help standardize this, seeing as um, all the donors have different length, length ulnas. We also measured the uh, length and width of the extensor indices muscle at that center point right there. And then also the length, width, and thickness of the extensor indices tendon themselves. We chose to only measure the muscles and tendons of the main tendon. So when there was accessory tendons, we chose not to measure them um, just due to the fact that if we did, the sample size wouldn't be large enough to get any uh, statistically significant data. And then our statistical analysis. Initially, uh, descriptive statistics were conducted on all numerical, numerical data to help determine our means, ranges, and standard deviations. And then we use ANOVAs to help determine the differences between our morphometric measurements and the classification types. There were some groups that were combined based on anatomic similarities to ensure that our sample sizes would be large enough to satisfy the requirements of the post hoc testing. Uh, this resulted in us having 10 classification groups um, for our ANOVAs. I'm gonna dive into some of those results here. Uh, the first piece of data I wanna discuss is the overall prevalence of the individual types. I'm not gonna take long in this slide because we didn't dive into each of the types, um, but this chart contains their overall prevalences, the prevalence on the right, left, and then bilateral prevalence. And I've highlighted the uh, three most prevalent in this study. We also looked at the different morphologies between the left and right, uh, but there were no significant values. We looked at the morphologies uh, between males and females, and we found uh, three statistically significant measurements. In the present study, the male cadavers demonstrated a longer tendon length of 105.64 millimeters uh, compared to 95.4 millimeters in females. Uh, male cadavers also had a larger muscle width at 13.22 millimeters compared to 11.83 millimeters. And additionally, male cadavers had a larger distance from the EIP muscle center uh, to the styloid process at 64.53 millimeters compared to 61.02 millimeters. And then this is the big chart. Um, if you look at the, the top row, you can see that some of the types have been combined. Um, again, this was just to satisfy that post hoc testing. In our present study, we found that types 2A1 and 2A2 demonstrated the shortest tendon lengths, being on average uh, 24.26 millimeters shorter than those of type 2C, which had the longest tendons. Type 2B2 tendons were found to be on average 2.94 millimeters wider than those of type 2A3. This is uh, demonstrating the difference between the widest and narrowest tendons. Um, and those were the two measurements that we found to be statistically significant. But why do we, why do we really care about this? Um, the two main clinical implications that I'm going to discuss are needle placements and some reconstructive surgeries. Uh, two procedures that use needle placement into the extensor indices are electromyography and botulinum injections. So electromyography is used to record action potentials of different nerves and help diagnose radiculopathy and nerve lesions. In cases of focal hand dystonia or post-stroke spasticity, the extensor indices is the target of electromyography to help identify C8 radiculopathy and radial nerve lesions. If this is identified to be the issue, uh, botulinum toxin injections are often used to help target the muscle belly itself and help relieve some of that spasticity. In previous studies, um, the ulnar styloid process was used as a landmark to help identify where in the antebrachium the extensor indices muscle lies. In one study, uh, it stated that the needle should be inserted 2.5 centimeters proximal from that ulnar styloid process. In another, it um, stated that the needle should be placed four centimeters proximal. 
But in our study, we found that the average extensor indices muscle center was just over six centimeters proximal to the ulnar styloid process, uh, which is inconsistent with the previously re reported data. Uh, this is important because it demonstrates some inconsistencies with this, and it really emphasizes that when you're injecting into small muscles like this, uh, the use of ultrasound or uh, preoperative imaging is just of the utmost importance. And then the last uh, procedure I want to talk about is the extensor indices opponents plasty. Opponents plasty is used uh, in the treatment of thenar muscle dysfunction. This happens in cases of extensor pollicis longus tendon rupture, median nerve palsy, and long-standing carpal tunnel. The procedure involves a tendon transfer to restore thumb abduction and opposition. The extensor indices uh, is one of the options for opponents plasty due to its redundant, redundant function with the extensor digitorum. Uh, the extensor indices is initially are harvested from its uh, insertion site and it's rerouted around the ulna um, and then inserted onto the abductor pollicis brevis insertion site. Several studies have demonstrated that the extensor indices opponents plasty has shown to have a greater postoperative function as compared to other approaches uh, using other tendons such as the pulmaris longus or the flexor digitorum superficialis. And this is due to the extensor uh, indices having a more direct line of action and it pro therefore provides su superior uh, mechanical advantage uh, due to the fact that it's more in line with the the thenar muscles that are already there. And then there are some limitations of the study. Um, due to the vast number of variations, our data set for each individual type was small, which caused our statistical analysis to be difficult. This was why we ended up having to uh, combine different results. Um, for future studies, we could focus on increasing sample sizes, and then we could um, look at doing some clinical studies using ultrasound and imaging uh, to help assess the extensor indices location on live patients. In conclusion, physicians should have a well-rounded understanding of the known variants of the extensor indices. This will help them to um, more accurately utilize the extensor indices tendon for, uh, as a donor tendon and more accurately target the muscle itself for injections, injection procedures. I would like to thank the, the donors and their families for making this possible. I would also like to thank Dr. Sarah Sloan, Dr. Nicole Fromerick, Jess Morehouse, Emma Gower, and Christian Willers for their contributions to this project. And then at that point, uh, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer.